What if you get itchy? That's Gosh. my biggest fear. Yeah. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Stephanie, and today we are back with another dun dun mukbang. Boo! Boo. <laughs> Guys, welcome to my wedding. I feel like this is Whoa. wedding style food. Does this not look like some Game of Thrones in the North? Jon Snow, winter is coming. Is that an ice block? No, it's not. It's a Himalayan salt block. What Bits. does that even mean? Like, that means I spent thirty dollars at World Market. You better recognize, okay? It's okay. That's what this that is means. thirty dollars. <laughs> yes, that's cheap. So you pretty much but cook on it, yeah? Amount of because salt? it slowly seasons your food with oh. Himalayan salt. I have my black glove on, so that means Wait, you know I'm I ready. I got you one right there. This is a juicy steak. Oh my god! What? Wow. Am I supposed to? Wipe it um, on here? I don't think you need to do all that, boo-boo. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. Okay. Wow. I feel like I taste the salt. Mm -hmm. Do you? Okay. I feel that way, too. Is it in my head? No, I taste that. Okay. For sure. Are you sure? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> This is very cool. I feel like we never were good at cooking steak. Like, never. Our steaks always turned out weird until we started cooking them in the weirdest ways possible. Right? Like, uh, lava Like the rock. lava rock, this. I'm gonna go in with a scallop. This is really intense to just grab a scallop like this and consume it, but like, it's my wedding day. I'm just kidding, it's not. It's not. But doesn't this look like a wedding spread? I'm gonna start using a fork and knife now. I'm just gonna jump right into today's story. Today's stories are kind of like a showdown, kind of a scary showdown, but I feel like mine are a little bit more intense. Honestly, I feel like I'm gonna win already. These are know? my biggest fears. The first story is kind of like an urban legend, okay? And so I don't really know how to categorize this story, and I feel like I briefly talked about it before, but very briefly, I never went into the thickums of it because I was just kind of terrified of this story because mm -hmm. I relate to this story on such a deep level. I don't even think you know. So I have this fear of noise. Like, I'm really crazy about oh, noise. Oh, yeah? That's very ironic. Yeah. Because yeah. me too. Oh, yeah? Okay, no, no. I have this fear of noise, not in the way that normal people have fear of, like, noises. Yeah. I have a fear of noise because I want to be able to hear everything. Mm. So, like, when we're in the bedroom or the bathroom, like, I never play anything too loudly. I get really upset if someone's, like, playing TV really, really loudly when I'm not, like, physically in the room with them, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. And so I just get super crazy about it. Like, I like to sleep with the door open. Like, I like to be there and hear every single sound. Because mm -hmm. I don't even think it has to do with the fact that there is a noise. I Like, you know how some people are like, oh, my God, the noise, my head hurts? I'm not like that. I feel like if someone's playing TV super loudly, I don't get into it. I don't get sucked into it because it's loud. I feel like I consciously feel myself like trying to like physically open my ear holes. I feel like I'm literally sitting there just concentrating on hearing past the noise. And so we kind of have this unspoken bond because we are in a relationship, okay? Aww. And so there is compromise. And so we do kind of have this unspoken bond where he doesn't really put in his AirPods unless I'm physically in like the same vicinity as him. Where I can be like, hello, right? Because we've had so many instances where he'll have his headphones on, he'll be listening to music, I'll be in the other room, I'll call his name, and it's nothing important, but I start panicking. Because so, I, I don't respond. Yeah, because I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Okay. And so <laughs> that's like our little compromise that we've come to. But I feel like subconsciously this all happened because many years ago I came across this story and I didn't even come across it on Reddit. I think I came across it maybe somewhere else that had reposted it from Reddit, but it all started on Reddit. Now, this is not a no sleep story. This is not a creepy pasta. This is not somebody telling you a story that never happened. This mm -hmm. was a response to a very serious Ask Reddit thread, which asked you, if you had ever murdered someone, how does that hurt you psychologically? Is it true that if you take someone's life, you will never recover? Wait, how does this relate to the, the noise? You'll see. Okay. Right? And so, obviously, a lot of the people that were responding, since they weren't in jail, and since they weren't trying to, like, criminalize themselves, most of the times they had murdered people through self-defense. 
So they were trying to explain, yeah, even though, you know, I murdered through self-defense, I still, like, have nightmares. I still feel so much guilt and so much shame, etc. And it's just a very serious Reddit thread with tons of emotions. And so this one was probably the top most talked about response to that one. And it was of a man. And this was posted maybe four years ago, right? And we're going to call him Johnny. He wanted to remain anonymous for reasons I totally respect. This is getting real dark. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to assume it's going to haunt you, right? It's going to follow you. Mm-hmm. Is this what? is going to haunt you in a different way from that. And so Johnny is living with his new wife of maybe, I want to say a couple years, and they have a little daughter, and she's about two years old at this point. So mm-hmm. they're just a very young, new family. And he, I believe he works as... um. Well, I forget what he works as, and it's not pretty pertinent to the story, right? But he does live in California, Northern California to be exact, the Bay Area. And Mm -hmm. so he lives in a townhouse. I believe the Bay Area is kind of similar to, I I don't want to say New York because it's completely different, but they have a lot of townhomes, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's three stories, and they have multiple bedrooms. They have the main area and the bottom floor. They've got bedrooms on the second, maybe the master on the third. Well, he was currently, it was Saturday morning, and he was currently in the second floor. Mm -hmm. And there was a spare bedroom that he was using as his home office now um he wasn't particularly working that saturday morning he decided that he wanted to play games now if you know anything about gamers motherfucking gamers i'm a gamer by the way if you guys have not followed my other channel miss mango bot i'm a gamer is that my stick? and so he's on the second floor and he's in the office and he decides to play this very loud game right where he has to interact with people and it's pretty much a multiplayer game where you play with people on the internet why do i sound like a 50 year old woman trying to explain gaming and so so he's playing this game and he decides you know what the only way to get into this game is to listen to it loudly and i understand because i have friends who are like into gaming and they just they can't just put on regular headphones and play like they can't just like put it on their speaker (laughs) and so so he's listening listening to it super super loudly on these headphones now i don't believe that they were noise canceling headphones i think there were other type of headphone right Mm-hmm. And he's listening to it, and every part of this game is super loud. Now, there was nothing to be alarmed. His wife and his daughter were staying home that day. They didn't have plans to go out. And if they did, I mean, he was pretty sure the wife was going to come in and be like, hey, babe, I'm going to go to the store with the kid real quick, right? But mm-hmm. there was none of that. And so he didn't really feel alert at all. And so he's playing this game, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the game went from being really loud and having so much action-packed noise. Mm-hmm. And there was a little lull in the game where, you know, there wasn't as many people fighting and his, you know, his teammates weren't talking. And so there was a quick little lull where he heard something and it wasn't coming from the game. He had heard something through the headphones and it seemed like, is that coming from downstairs? Is that, is that my wife? Maybe she's calling my name maybe she needs help with a kid maybe she's like balancing 25 things right and she's like you better get your ass down here before i drop this pickle jar on the ground Mm -hmm. and so he he takes off his headphones and his heart stops because he hears a man Uh now this man is not a ups guy this man is not a family friend this man is yelling angrily yelling at his wife okay saying shut the f up and and threatening to hurt their child. And he was just gaming, huh? Yeah. And how it, that doesn't make any sense. You know automatically when you hear the words coming from a voice you don't recognize, a voice filled with aggression, a voice threatening your kid in your own house, you know that your wife didn't invite them in. Your wife probably does not want this person in the house. He had a legal weapon. Mm -hmm. Right? That he had Mm -hmm. the license for. And he grabbed it out the safe. And he slowly creeped down the stairs. Mm -hmm. And what he saw was a very large man assaulting his wife. No. And he said... No, just like in the middle of the day. And like the front door was broken open. And he said that it wasn't trying to. Like... Wait, I'm sorry, what? Like it was like it was it was in process, not trying to. And so he creeps down the stairs and he sees that this big burly man and I mean his two year old daughter is crying in the corner, right? And so he sees that this man is um 
has has a knife in his hand, right? And so he's scared because he's not very, like, he's not, you know, CIA, what do you call it, special forces, you know? It's very dangerous with situations like this. I mean, the whole situation is dangerous, but he knows what he is wanting to do, but it's dangerous because of the proximity of everybody, right? He comes in from behind, grabs the hand of the man with the knife in it, and so the guy turns around and looks shocked. Like, whoa, what is this dude doing here? Because I believe that he didn't think that anybody else was home, right? And so then the husband fires at him three times and he falls to the ground. Now the wife is obviously hysterical and their two-year-old daughter is crying in the corner. And for some reason he said instincts took over and he said this was probably damaging for my relationship, but like I just had to get my daughter out of there. And so he just like left with the kid. A neighbor came out because the neighbor was like, did you hear that? Did you hear that? And he didn't even realize that he was like covered in blood. And so then he has his kid in an arm and he has his weapon in one arm, right? And he goes straight up to the neighbor and the neighbor is looking so freaking alarmed, right? And then he goes, what happened, right? And then he just gives the kid to the neighbor, gives the weapon to the neighbor, and he just says, I have to go check on my wife. And the neighbor looks at him and goes, did you hurt her? And he goes, no, and walks back in and, you know, comforts her until the authorities come. I, th- the, I, I feel like we've talked about something like this, but it was like a horror story, right? So the reason that I call it an urban legend is because even though it was posted on a Reddit thread that is known for taking their responses very seriously, the Reddit community is interesting because typically... People are very respectful of what type of thread it's posted on. So if you get caught in a lie on a thread, because like they can look up anything you've ever posted, you know? So there have been a lot of instances where people will lie on Reddit and get called out for it, right? But typically, Reddit is really good. Like the community is really good in not posting bull responses to serious questions. Sure. The police did try to, they were thinking about charging or pressing charges on him. Right. But that guy had a criminal record. Yeah, so... Wait, so that guy is gone. Yeah. And so what they were saying is, well, what he was saying was his experience was... I guess his response was maybe not the most accurate for a thread like this because the thread like this was mainly dealing with, you know, what were the traumas of the actual act, right? But he he went into the traumas of the whole situation, right? Which I believe is like, you know, how it would be perceived as as a person, right? And so he was saying that he like just can't listen to things loudly ever. And like his wife, even though they never, like she never stepped back into that house ever like they immediately like stayed with other people got a new house and then they had movers do it because she just could not go back into that house but she can't even be alone like in a room inside their new house so i mean but it's crazy because a lot of redditors were like really impressed that you know they still stayed together because there could be a lot of like resentment Mm -hmm. or just fear or anger you know because technically he was inside the house you know so what did he say about that is there anything lingering besides just fear? Guilt, fear. So you read the whole post. Mm-hmm. How did it sound real to you, or it did? I mean, I hope it's not true, right? I wish I could say I found it on no sleep. Well, I don't know how to follow up to that. No, maybe you should lighten it up. Okay, well I'm gonna tell a really, really short one. <laughs> really. Okay. Easy going one. <laughs> Easy going. This is, um, imagine you're getting into an Uber, right? No. <laughs> I hate Ubers. Why do you hate Uber? Okay, continue. Continue with this. No, but this one's different. This one's different. Because imagine you're getting to, you call, you call an Uber. They came. You get into the car, right? Imagine just you, right? You get into the car. And the Uber driver turned around, look at you. And he asked. So, um. Where would you two like to go tonight? Oh no. (laughs) Oh no. How do you feel about that? So what do you think is happening? You think he's pranking you? 
Okay, so either there's a ghost next to me, right? Right. A ghost got in with me. Uh-huh. Or, uh -huh. which, by the way, if that happens, I'm screwed. But the other option is uh -huh. that the Uber driver is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, uh -huh. which in that case, I could also be equally as screwed. Mm -hmm. So this is a lose-lose situation. Or he's just pranking you for Halloween. I appreciate Uber drivers, mm -hmm. and I feel like most Uber driver experiences I've had have been really unpleasant. <laughs> unpleasant? Pleasant. Oh, okay. I've only had that one square, square, one scare where he literally asked me if I wanted to put on his multiple wigs mm -hmm. and like take a selfie or something. It was freaking nuts and creepy and just, just out of this world, you right? Want a wig? Pull out a head. No, and he was wearing a wig too. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. he looked nothing like the picture that I got. And I was so scared. I was so creeped out. I wanted to cry so badly. And he pulled out all these other wigs. I mean, it was just a shit show, okay? But other than that, it's been pretty pleasant. But it's like forced companionship. Like, if my Uber driver is talking to me, there's no way in hell I'm going to blow him off. I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, that is so interesting. Tell me more. Even though I probably don't want to know more because you are the one driving. Mm -hmm. And you could drive us into a ditch or into some ranch in the backyard and murder me. Yeah. So. I'm just saying. The whole concept and theory is super warped. I mean, I guess it comes in handy when you're drunk. But then again, in theory, that's even more dangerous. <laughs> and so we just talked about somebody who lost their sense of hearing for briefly, right? And some bad shit happened. But what if you live in a world for maybe briefly, maybe it's a day, maybe it's 30 minutes, maybe in some cases that are extreme, maybe it's four months, or maybe it's for years where you can hear everything going on, you can feel all the pain, you can do all of these things, but you can't control any movements. This is literally one of my biggest nightmares. I feel like there was a Black Mirror episode that kind of covered this where it was like this dude who was just going through the motions and he just had to repeat it day in, day out, day in, day out. And you can feel everything, but you can't move? Yeah. I believe when you're paralyzed, right, in most cases that I've researched, right, I'm mm -hmm. sure that there are exceptions, but when you are paralyzed, you don't have as much feeling in those parts, right? And so even if someone were to come up to you and maybe there was a little bit of pressure there, you would probably feel it much, 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 much less than somebody who wasn't mm -hmm. paralyzed. Okay. And so imagine being paralyzed but having all of those senses still there. Imagine being able to hear and think but you can't talk and nobody knows that you can hear and think. And that is literally my biggest fear. That's the feeling of going into a vegetative state, which I believe is more of like the medical lingo. Like I'm sure there's like a true medical word for it, but I mean, from what I've heard, a lot of people that were in this state use this word, but I don't know these days, it could be totally insensitive, but I believe it's a vegetative state. And so that is the life, somebody who can't move, who can't tell people that, hey, I hear you, even when you can hear everything going on, you can feel what's happening to you. I mean, it's an absolute torture chamber in there. Like, imagine just being stuck with your mind 24 seven nonstop. You know what like, I'm always worried, what? wonder about? What if you get itchy? What do you do? Like that, oh I've, my that's gosh. my biggest fear. Oh my god! Like I, it sometimes itchy. gets so itchy. Yeah. Yeah, you can't scratch like this yeah. middle of your back, and it yeah. gets so frustrating. That is so true. I and like suddenly I'm so itchy. Right? Yeah. I don't think that should be your biggest fear, <laughs> I mean, but it's a solid point. You know, it's a very solid fear. Yeah. <laughs> so um, today's story is going to be kind of about Kate's story, right? Yeah. So at this point, Kate, that's her name. She was living in the UK and she was a teacher. She was loving her job. She was very, very young at the time. And she had just moved in with her boyfriend and they had a bunch of cats. And she was living her goddamn dream. Honestly, that's how she said it. She wasn't, she wasn't exactly ecstatic. She had just gotten into teaching but it was what she wanted to do so she mm -hmm. just was very content with herself right yeah now one day she wakes up and she says oh my gosh i feel like shit. i cannot go to work today i think i have the flu and so she calls mm -hmm. out of work with the flu and three days later she's in a coma what it just escalated so quickly so quickly right off the bat just day after day for those three days she just went into complete shutdown her body completely shut down they did a bunch of scans on her brain because they're wondering mm -hmm. how did she go into a coma like how did she slip into a coma yeah. if you get a flu there is a lot of other things that probably would happen if the flu escalates but a coma like it's just very confusing and so essentially one of the biggest causes of getting into a coma i believe or going into that vegetative state is when your brain swells it's so swollen. 
That's pretty much. I'm sorry. Okay, the reason that you know what? Can you not look at my face and when I say swollen like that? Okay, please. What happens after that? The brain is like so swollen, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and so the brain swells, right? And it's a very serious condition, and there's mm. not a lot that people can do about it, right? And so okay. her brain is swelled up. I believe she's having like spinal cord issues too, and so she slips into a coma. She's in the hospital, and all the doctors are telling her friends and family like it's it's not looking up. Like we don't know what's going on, and everybody's asking questions. How does she go from a flu where she could have just taken some mother? in day quill mm -hmm. and now she's in a coma like no. what do you mean like did you put her under are you trying to scam us is this insurance fraud like what the fuck is going on right mm -hmm. and so they're all getting triggered and her boyfriend ends up during these four months ends up eventually leaving her four months yeah because you know for him it was like it wasn't just that it was four months it was that they didn't know if it was gonna be four months four years 40 years never right like so, during just four months she's just laying on the yeah, hospital bed she's on like pretty much life support like they're pretty much saying we think that she's pretty much brain dead like just from a flu yeah there's <sighs> like i mean that's what we think like we don't think that there is gonna be like for her to wake up is just like a miracle just like that just just yeah. a flu and she's yeah okay so i think that like when there's a lot of i think that's why comas are so dangerous like when you slip into this state like not a medically induced coma but when you're talking about like a vegetative state is what they call it i believe i could be wrong but these people who personally talked about it they called it a vegetative state so i'm gonna go with their word on this one right when they talk about it they said it's like the doctors can't really do anything like they're just kind of like rapunzel because you're just kind of hoping that they wake up mm. but what more can you do than try to make them as comfortable as they can be while they're in that state but you can't really wake them up mm -hmm. like you can't feed them anything like adrenaline and make them wake up like it doesn't work like that they're they're just trying to make sure that you don't die in the process and that you are kind of as comfortable as can be, mm -hmm. right? But the interesting thing is most of the time, right? So what, like like you were saying before, yeah. only your family has the, can make the decision for you? Is that what happens when you're in that state? I believe it's different per country. Mm. But I believe here it's your family or your spouse. Mm. If you don't have a spouse, I think it's your family. Wow. But I believe people these days are getting more woke and they're like, I didn't trust my spouse, I didn't trust my family, I'm going to write it down. <laughs> oh, you can do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you write it down with like a lawyer and it's like, okay, they have like a DNR, which is like, do not resuscitate. Oh. Which means like if you, the doctor believes that they're brain dead, don't put everything in their power to bring them back alive. Because once you go, allegedly, like once you go into that clinical state of brain dead, where like you're in a vegetative state, when you wake up, it's not like you turned off the lights and turned it back on. Mm-hmm. First of all, the fact that if the lights turn on, that's a miracle. But once the lights are on, you don't know what's in the room. You don't know if you're working with paralysis. You don't know if you're working with inability to move, talk, breathe on your own. You don't know what's there. Like once the lights are off, when they come back on, it's not the same room. It's completely mm. different, right? You and so a lot of people... What's functioning. Yeah, yeah, and so the, the, that's why you have like half and half of people. Half the people are like, whatever, I'm, I want to be alive. It doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have the other half of people that are like, even if I come back, like I have to deal with all of this, like I'm good, you know? So they say and also the chances of coming back are slim and then who gets stuck with the medical bills could be your spouse, yeah. you know? And so it's very tricky. It's very, very tricky, right? And so Kate, she at this point, she's super young, goes into a, a vegetative state, and at this point she's just she's just stressed because she hears everything. And she hears everyone. And and she's laying in this hospital bed and she she can't move. She can't talk, but she hears the doctor telling her parents that this is it. There's no hope. She's brain dead. We don't know what's wrong. But she hears it. And she, and she hears can think? it. And she thinks. And she, hmm. she said, they all say kind of similar things, you know? And they all say it's almost like that nightmare that everybody has where you're just screaming but nothing comes out. Oh I have those nightmares gosh. all the time where I'm calling 911 trying to tell them what's going on. But, like, I can't talk for some reason. Hmm. She said, think about that every second of every day but times a million. Is that Torture. 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 She said oh it is gosh. torturous. And she was under for about four months, right? Now, during this time, thankfully, she had a lot of people on her team that was like, okay, you know, 
we're gonna try it right and i believe that there was this one doctor that she spoke kind of highly of which i think he was at that time undergoing some sort of study where he wanted to study like wait why did this young healthy girl with no prior medical history go into a coma because she got a flu it doesn't make sense and so they put her under a ct scan and he decided i just want to make sure she's brain dead right yeah. and so he started showing her these very very bright pictures like pictures of just bright flowers and apparently when the human brain sees bright flowers or something with just high vivid intensity saturated uh-huh. color there's a certain part of the brain we'll that kind of light lights up wait so she she can't even see with her yeah. eyes holy cow and it lit up wow and so he goes oh wait a second but then he goes okay maybe maybe i'm like getting ahead of myself maybe like this is just like what happens right mm-hmm. and so then he showed pictures like a very blurry picture that didn't have anything in it Mm -hmm. and then she showed pictures of family because when you see faces you recognize there's a very specific part of your brain that lights up very specific just the faces you know yeah or just most of the time it's faces but very strong with faces that you recognize Mm. it's like a human Ah. acknowledging another human almost you know it's like a very specific and maybe is that why dogs are like you're a dog i'm a dog let's hang out dog yeah Dog hangs out with people, honey. Oh, yeah. Our dog don't care about other dogs. Okay, but I have this working theory. <laughs> Hold on, side note. I have this working theory that dog breeds no dog breeds. I swear they do. I, I swear I when know. our dogs see another Frenchie, they get more excited. I don't think so. I think so. Yeah, I highly doubt. They I don't think even so. like each other. Let's. T- <laughs> okay, but when they go over to my sister's house, she's got a Chihuahua and she's got a Frenchie. Who do they hang out with? Because Chihuahua the Frenchie. doesn't want to hang out with them, honey. Come on. <laughs> Leave it in you the comments. You, I can't be the only one. You can't generalize one. them. No, I believe so. <laughs> she pretty much is stuck in there for about four months, and miraculously, she wakes up from her vegetative state. Just like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I wouldn't consider it waking up. I guess that's more used for comas. But she she becomes alert of her situation. Now, when she did become alert, it wasn't normal. And so she ends up waking up from her vegetative state. And she wakes up and she has the inability to walk. So she's been wheelchair bound since then. So she went to therapy. And her therapy did an interview, right? And her therapist was just saying, like, She was so strong in the fact that she wanted to help other people and she went on to go write a book, right? Mm -hmm. And her main thing was that she was just so angry. Like she had so much anger in her. She had anger that this happened to her. First of all, where did this happen? It came out of nowhere. How did she not know this was going to happen? Like what a sick world, right? Where this just randomly happens to a young, healthy woman, right? Mm -hmm. And so she's upset with that. She's upset that she lost her boyfriend, her career, her money, like everything. And now she lost her sense of taste, her sense of smell. She can't really talk. and she can't walk so she is wheelchair bound and so her life is completely flipped upside down like I said when you turn on the lights it's not the same is what a lot of doctors will say right and so she heavily believes that a lot of it might have been that people like doctors just give up Mm. she said maybe if she hadn't been in there for four months and let her body deteriorate and her muscles atrophy to the extent that they did in four months, maybe she would have woken up to, you know, Mm. other things. Or maybe if she was, you know, they worked harder at finding a solution, they could have prevented more things from happening. Is that true, though? It depends, I guess. But didn't you say, like, once you get into that state, there's nothing you can do? That's what the doctors say, Um. right? But I, I just don't know. Wow. Yeah, and there was actually another case of this that was really, really popular. And I think this one is probably more popular than um, Kate's story because she went on to be very, very popular in media. So she's actually an ESPN anchor. She was on Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, yeah. And she's a competitive swimmer at one point. She was really good at swimming. And so what happened to her when she was super young, she went into a coma too. She had two autoimmune diseases that attacked at the same time and her brain swelled, her spinal cord swelled, like everything was swollen. But she was in a vegetative state for four years. Four years. And she can hear? She can hear. she She could feel a little bit. But she couldn't do anything. And so a lot of the times she would see her doctors tell her parents, like, you just have to face the fact that, like, your daughter's gone. Like, just face the fact. And, like, she would be, like, she would see her mom cry, break down. And that's when she was like, now I'm going to stay right here, right? And so she just, 
there was nothing she could do either you know it's not like it's not like a willpower thing where you're just like oh my alarm went off like I gotta wake up now you know it's just like what do you do you can just only hope for the best right and so she sees everything she said that you know every day she would see her family do shifts they would take shifts wow. and so they would come they would try to talk to her but mainly they just kind of like I mean what can you do right and so her they don't know he, she can't hear no that's because crazy. the doctors pretty much told the family that she's brain dead. Because I feel like it's one of those things, like, how do you really know when someone's brain dead? The CT exam Yeah, but what about there's, like, that chance? I don't know. All right, that's crazy. Right? And that's so crazy. she wasn't brain dead. She, like, could hear. She could, you know, she just couldn't move. Mm. And so she just felt like she was in there for a bajillion years. Uh-huh. She didn't know what to do. She was super young. And then eventually she... And then what happened was four years into it, she started having about three seizures a day. Three seizures a day. And it was painful Mm -hmm. and horrendous. And like I said, she's mentally aware. And her parents were in pain because they they see it. They hear that she had a seizure. And it's not like, oh, just because maybe she's in a vegetative state, she doesn't feel or, you know, Mm -hmm. that's like their kid, right? I believe she felt a lot. Right. And so then like her biggest thing was like she her eyes would roll back anytime they would sit her up. It's like she wanted to look at her family, but her like anytime they try to open her eyes, her eyes would roll back. But she can like think. So she's like, why? Like, it's so frustrating, you know, like I just uh, like she's just getting frustrated. Right. And so then at this point, year four, she started having these seizures about three times a day. And so the doctors started administrating this medicine that was just going to prevent the seizures. They weren't trying to do anything. They were just like, she needs to stop having these seizures. Here's some medicine. It'll hopefully stop the seizures. But what it ended up doing is hitting some sort of motor skill that she didn't have that was what temporarily skill? like a like a like some something. It hit mm. something that was temporarily for the past four years not working. Mm. It kind of kicked it to action. And so she remembers that a couple days on that anti-seizure medication, all of a sudden, she like opened her eyes by herself. What? And at that moment, nobody was really in the room. I think her mm. mom had gone out to like get something, like get food I or mean, something, that, right? That's kind of scary too. Yeah. If the mom was there, like, yeah. whoa. And so she opened her eyes and she's like, wait a second. Wait a second. Like I hear, I, I, I'm going to mm-hmm. look at the TV. And she looks at the TV, right? Wow. And she's like. And she still can't talk right now. Mm. She can't do anything but move her eyes. Mm-hmm. And so she's like, this is kind of crazy. Like, what does this mean, right? And so her mom walks in. And her mom opens the door. Now, obviously, because she was in this state for the past four years, her mom's first instinct isn't to run over there and be like, babe, are you awake now? You know? Yeah. Her instinct is to just open the door, probably put her coffee down, grab her phone. And she's like, okay, I'm just going to follow my mom, right? And so she keeps following her mom through the room, mm-hmm. right? And I, I don't know if her mom sensed it or her mom was like, I feel like she, something's looking at me. She looked and she's like, and then she rushes over to her side and she's like, can you hear me? Can you blink if you hear me? And she's like nonstop blinking, she said, because she's like, I can hear you, babe. Oh my <laughs> yeah. gosh. And so then that's when they slowly, like, I don't know if they did something different medically. I, mean, I don't know. She said that they didn't really do anything crazy different. She just naturally started waking gradually up. Gradually got better. Yeah, gradually got better. And she said it wasn't easy. Like, it took her six months just to learn how to talk again and stuff. Wait, how old was she? Do you know? She was young. Like, I think in her, like, 12 maybe when she woke up but what's crazy is that she was actually wheelchair bound she could talk and she she didn't lose any senses um like kate right so she was very very lucky she could talk she could do all these things she just couldn't walk right and her doctors told her that's what happens you turn on the lights and this is what we're working with you know at least you're alive like it's crazy that you're alive Mm -hmm. and so she couldn't walk and she was like yeah, but at one point they said I was going to die and yeah. I was brain dead and I wasn't. And so she was wheelchair bound for 10 years and she worked really, really hard. But, I, you know, I don't like to say that because there's also a lot of people who you can't like work hard and make it move, you know? Yeah, 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 and yeah. so it was just like everything was in the right cards for her. And she ended up, she ended up walking again. Huh. And then she was on Dancing with the Stars as a semi-finalist. So I'm just saying. Yeah. So she was dancing and everything. Yeah, so she was dancing better wow. than me. And I have been walking for the past 10 years. So f*** my life. See? There's yeah. just some things that, you know, we take for granted. And, yeah. and when you lose it, just opening your eyes is like a blessing. 
Yeah, you got real deep there. It was intense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your story is very... Um, Sorry, today's stories are all kind of you dark and deep. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to compete with that. And confusing. I don't know how I got here, yeah. honestly. But I do have a story, though. Let me okay, just... okay. <laughs> He's like, but I'm going to still try. <laughs> this is, uh, is kind of similar to the story that you shared one time. Um, I don't know. I forgot if the ones you sh- shared was real or not, but this one was real, right? <laughs> This was about a girl who was, uh, she's, she's a teenager, and uh, one time she was um, leaving the house, right? And uh, as she's leaving the house, she was locking the door, leaving the house, and she lives in an apartment building. And mm-hmm. she doesn't li- live too high up, it was like sixth floor or something, and she usually walks down the stairs to go to the bottom floor. Right? Nobody else was home, she locked the door, started walking down. Two floors down, she was basically talking on the phone with her mom. So mm-hmm. he was, she was talking, and she was talking, and she was like, yes, mom, I locked the door, blah, 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 all of that, right? As soon as she hung out the phone, she noticed something different. At this point, she was probably at, what, fourth floor, right? Walking down, all the way down. And she felt something different. She couldn't remember what's going on, but very quickly, she started hearing, this is the time she realized When she was on the phone, walking downstairs, she heard somebody walking upstairs. And as soon as she hung out the phone, they they stopped. And then a few seconds later, you see the step just rushing up. And at that moment, her adrenaline started pumping. She just had this terrible feeling. She turned around, she starts sprinting upstairs. Okay. she can tell there's somebody just running up like crazy. So she couldn't think at this point. Uh, she ran from the fourth floor to the fifth floor. She lives on the sixth, right? Mm. On the fifth floor, she starts taking out keys from her pocket. She, she starts grabbing her key and getting ready to open the door and rush in. She just runs and runs. But the, the person beneath her is running super, super fast. You can tell the step is getting closer and closer and closer. She finally ran to the sixth floor. And as she's opening the door, she can feel somebody is on the sixth floor. And as she finally opened the door, get in, closed the door, right before she closed the door, she saw a shadow, maybe just a few steps behind her. If she slows down for one more second, he could have touched her in the back. She closed the door and she froze right behind the door. She can hear right outside the door, whichever person was, they stood there for maybe 10 seconds. They didn't do anything. They didn't leave. They didn't move closer. They didn't knock on door. They froze also for 10 seconds. And then eventually you hear that person turn around and walked away. And that's the moment that she said that was the scariest moment of her life because she was thinking, what was that man thinking in that 10 seconds? Was he thinking about breaking in? Was he thinking about what to say? Was he thinking about something else? She doesn't know. Creepy. Yeah. But I thought, I thought. Yeah. She was gonna run in. Uh huh. And she didn't lock the door. Oh, and he just opens the door. No. What? And they were working as a team. So he, he's running up behind her, but it's all a ruse, cause it's already someone in her apartment waiting. What? So she didn't lock the door. Someone was snuck in. And now another man. But she locked the door. She definitely locked the door. Well, maybe she didn't. Anyways, I thought that was pretty scary too. Yeah, but that was a true story. But didn't you share that about this this mom in Korea? With the pin that she was typing to open the door? That was similar. But that was elevator and then door. No, I think it's real. Was that was real? real? I oh, feel yeah, like yeah, it I was a real so. story. Oh, that was a serial killer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the yeah, yellow yeah. yellow jacket dude. Yes, raincoat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yellow raincoat. Yeah. Murder. Yeah. I used to walk stairs every every day growing up. It's it's pretty scary. Like to me, when I was young, stairs in the in the building is really scary. I think so. Have you ever experienced scary. that? No. Yeah, because those stairs usually it's pretty dark. And then all the lights, let me tell you something. The lights in the stairs are all sensor lights. So they turn off and on. As you walk up. So when you look, like you peek up or peek down, it's black. But sometimes the sensor light is not as sen- what is it? sensitive. Like you have, I have to walk super loud. So you, you try to walk like crazy, like do this to turn on the light before you walk up the stairs. 
Yeah, it's pretty freaky. Good indigestion. <laughs> I have really bad indigestion. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's really creepy, but you want to know what's creepier? Um, what's really creepier? brief. Our last apartment, mm -hmm. they have a master key for every apartment. That's every apartment. 400 honey. apartment honey, units. Honey, that's every apartment a unit. Who's going to get in? Who's going to open the door for you? No, the, the older apartments that still have the keys, mm -hmm. they're all different. Well, yeah, but somebody still has access to it. Yeah, but it's Oh, you're a saying that somebody got key. it? Yeah. Just one key can open every single apartment. I'll fuck with that. Mm -mm. I got to go, guys. Today's video was like not our normal scary showdown but i think it was scarier yeah because these were real. like too real and too dark yeah. and i know some of it's you guys don't sad. like it i'm so sorry but we'll be back tomorrow with hopefully a goofier one i love you guys so so much and i'll see you guys tomorrow bye